If you've not gotten a handout, please see. Please raise your hand so Todd can see. Handout for this morning. There's a couple over here. I know he's been busy trying to get those out for me. Thank you, Todd. All right, well, good morning. This lesson is the first of a series of six. We'll be going over the book of Esther. If you remember back in the winter and spring of this year, we as a church, all the way from third grade through adults, studied Ezra and Nehemiah. We talked about the rebuilding of the temple in Ezra, the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem in Nehemiah, and the rebuilding of the, the spiritual nature of the Jews at that time. Because remember, the Jews weren't in Jerusalem, at least a large portion of them. They were under other rulers. And so it was important for them to rebuild their, their uh, spiritual fortitude and get back to God. So when I went to the Freed Harbin lectureships this past February, they were also talking about Ezra and Nehemiah, but they also included Esther. And I went to several of those lectures and thought that would be a great addition for our class sometime at, at Gold Hill Road would be to talk about Esther because it happens around the same time in about the same area as Esther, so, as Ezra and Nehemiah. So how many of you have ever done a real deep study of the book of Esther? Just curious. Several of you? Excellent. I will say if you have done that before and you have have some insights from prior classes or your prior personal study, please feel free to raise your hand, just call out, share them during these next six weeks. We'll be glad to talk about those together. The book of Esther. So our class objectives, first of all, we want to understand the text. What does the spiritually inspired Word of God say about this book? We'll do a deep dive verse by verse over the next few weeks. Also, I want to understand the context of it. And that's what a large portion of today's lesson will be on, is what was going on at the time? Who were the main characters, the main actors that were playing a role in the time of the writing and the actions of the book of Esther? And then life applications. What does reading this book and understanding it mean for us today? I also want us to see the unseen God in the book. A little bit of foreshadowing here, but can anybody tell me one of the main unique things about the book of Esther in the Bible? Yes. The name of God is never mentioned in the book. But does that mean that God is absent from the book? Absolutely not. And so what I want us to do is to see the parts in the book where the unseen God can be seen through his actions, through his providence. And then we'll discuss that providence and attributes of godly leaders. How can we learn from the characters in this, in this book? things that we should do and things that we should avoid. So if you have your Bibles, of course, you know that Esther, according to the categories that are put by man, belongs at the end of the books of history, right after Ezra and Nehemiah. But these are not necessarily in order of how the events took place or the order of how things were written. For instance, we see the book of Daniel, which is right at the end of the major prophets. The first few chapters of Daniel actually occur prior to Ezra. They were in Babylonian captivity. Thank you. Babylonian captivity under King Nebuchadnezzar. You remember he's the king that threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. However, right after that, then we start Ezra because the Persians came in and took over the Babylonian empire. And so Babylon got incorporated into Persia and we start Ezra with King Cyrus. The first few chapters of Ezra uh, talk about rebuilding the temple, and then neatly between Ezra 6 and Ezra 7, there is a lull, a time period, where Esther fits. So we have Daniel, the first few chapters, then we move over into Ezra 1 through 6, and then the time frame of Esther. And then after that, while Daniel's still living, of course, in the Babylon area, we have the rest of Ezra, 7 through 10, and then we have the events of Nehemiah. So here's just a little chart for you. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon is the first few chapters of Daniel. And then we start into Persian rule, and we have King Cyrus, which begins Ezra. And then we have King Darius, or Darius the Great. Remember, this is the guy who threw Daniel into the lion's den. And again, a little bit of foreshadowing. Once a Persian king makes a rule, such as King Darius did, that everybody had to worship him and him alone, that rule or law could not be changed even by the king himself. That was just one of the things about Persian law. And so he ends up throwing Daniel into the lion's den. King Darius' son, Xerxes, 
is the main king in the book of Esther. The Hebrew name of Xerxes is Ahasuerus. And so when we're studying this book, you'll see King Ahasuerus is the same king as King Xerxes, the son of Darius the Great, who threw Daniel in the lion's den. And then not long after King Xerxes, his son, King Artaxerxes, again in Persia, starts taking rule. And this King Artaxerxes is the king that Nehemiah goes before and asks to return to Jerusalem to help rebuild the walls. So that's the time frame there. Again, Ezra 1 through 6, then Esther, then Ezra 7 through 10, and then Nehemiah. That's the timeline there. So Esther predates Nehemiah by about 30 years and creates the goodwill because, of course, Esther brings up the Jews there in the Persian Empire, and many people think that helped allow Nehemiah, who's a Jew, to be the cupbearer for the Persian king Artaxerxes and allowed Artaxerxes to be so free to allow Nehemiah to go back and help the Jews uh, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And the reason I put this chart up here is just because of that bottom. I know it's hard to read, but in Nehemiah chapter 2, Nehemiah goes before King Artaxerxes and says, I would like to go back to rebuild the wall. The Bible tells us in verse 6 there that the queen was sitting beside Artaxerxes. Queen is not mentioned, but some scholars have speculated that See, the time frame between Esther and Nehemiah was about 30 years. Esther was probably in her teens when she was in Esther. So she would have probably been around 40, maybe in, the, in her 50s at this time. So that queen sitting by Artaxerxes may have actually been Esther sitting there when Nehemiah came and asked to go back and rebuild the walls. If it wasn't, at least Esther would have been prominent within the kingdom at that time. So this is the Persian Empire around the time that Darius the Great and Xerxes was around. So the dark green is that Persian. If you'll notice this, just for uh, clarity, this right here is Egypt, the top northeast corner of Africa. Leading into Asia, we have Israel, where Jerusalem is. Up here is Asia Minor, leading into the Middle East. So we have Babylon, which of course that's where Nebuchadnezzar was, and that got incorporated into the Persian Empire when Persia take, took over. We have Susa right here, which is the capital. That would be like our Washington, D.C. That's where, not president, but at that time it was the king who lived and, and ruled in Susa. As we read Esther, it's called Shushan, S-H-U-S-H-A-N, but it's the same capital, Susa. And then we have the rest of the part of Persian Empire over here. There was an edict of Cyrus in Ezra chapter 1. Once he took over Babylonian rule, he allowed a lot of those captives from Babylon, the Jews, to be able to go back to Jerusalem if they wished. And some of them did. However, as you can imagine, you're in the Persian area and you've incorporated into that. And you have friends there. You found a job there. You have a, a home there. So many Jews didn't leave. And because of that, they stayed around. Many of them were around Susa at the time of Esther. And that's where we pick up the book. Sometimes when we read the Old Testament, particularly uh, the stories of maybe Jonah and the whale or Noah and the ark, maybe even uh, Cyrus, the Edict of Cyrus and going into Xerxes and Esther, a lot of times it's easy to kind of gloss over them as irrelevant or maybe even fable-like. But I want you to know that the people and the, the characters, the events in this book are real. They really happened. And so about... 1879, relatively recently, there was a cylinder found called the Cyrus Cylinder, which talked about the conquests of Cyrus and, and his rule in allowing the Jews to go back to Jerusalem. And so this happened 2,300 years, 2,500 years after his rule. So these are real things that happened. Archaeologists are still finding. This is the seal of Xerxes, or Ahasuerus, as we're going to talk about in, in Esther. When he put this seal on clay tablets, that law could not be changed. Or if it was parchment or paper, when he put his signet ring on there, that law could not be changed. This was found, again, relatively recently. The book of Esther is unique. We've talked about why it's unique because God's name is not mentioned. But there's a couple of other traits or events or things that happen in Esther or happen in other books that are not found in Esther. Anybody have a, a guess as to other things that are traditionally in other books of the Bible but not found in Esther? Mention of God, definitely. Anything else? How about prayer or forgiveness? None of those are mentioned specifically in the book of Esther. In fact, one scholar said if we replaced the word Jew in Esther with some other ethnic group, no one would believe it was supposed to be in the Bible. And that may be true on a superficial level. However, I would argue, as we go through this study, you'll find out, because it's the Jews... 
And because it's God's people and his providence in taking care of them, that's the reason it should be in the Bible. It's because it proves that God keeps his promises, that the Jews were taken care of, lead into the Messiah. In fact, the word Jew or Jewish is mentioned only once before Ezra, but it's mentioned 52 times in the book of Esther, and then only a couple times in the Old Testament after the book of Esther. So it's really concentrated there, where the Jews are focused on when they're living out in exile in the Persian territory. So there is a historical debate. Very little is mentioned of Esther among the early church documents. Some people refer to the book, some others don't. Melito, in fact, excluded Esther from his list of books. He only had 38 of 39 in his Old Testament. He didn't like putting Esther in there because it doesn't mention God and prayer and forgiveness. But Origen included it. Some read it as a love story and it has some components of a love story in it. Some read it more like political espionage and certainly you could find that in it too if you like. Martin Luther hated the book. He said it had heathen perversity in it. Didn't like it. But of course Martin Luther also did not like the book of James saying that it was a epistle of straw because it talked about faith without works being dead and he didn't like that particular part of God's word. It's the only Old Testament book, Esther, that's not mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So you can see why there would be some debate about whether it should be in, involved in the Old Testament or not. The original Hebrew text, which is what we have, also called the Masoretic text, uh, it doesn't mention God, it doesn't mention the Bible, and so, or it doesn't mention prayer. And so you can imagine other people might want to slip those in there in order to make it more palatable. There's two Greek texts, including the Septuagint, that includes 107 additional verses, including prayers by Mordecai and Esther, and 50 mentions of God by name. So we've already alluded to it, but why do you think that there would be those additions to the, uh, to the book? To validate the authenticity of it, absolutely. Although it seems kind of suspicious to me that they would add so many verses, and then about half of them on average would include the things that were excluded originally. So Ward says a critic of texts obviously prefers the original, and I believe the spiritually inspired word is what we should go on, the original. Additional perspectives. The first century authors, including Josephus, who was not a Christian, just a Jewish historian, he accepted Esther into the canon because it talked about all the, the, the Jews at that time, and, and it was a, a good book of history as well. And there's an argument, though I don't put a lot of weight into this, there's those who say, well, if Jesus and his Jewish disciples didn't want Esther in the canon or didn't believe it should be in there, they would have said something about it. And since they didn't, then it should be in there. Uh, there's a lot of things that Jesus referred to, his disciples referred to, that are not included in our uh, New Testament. But just because it's not recorded for us doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just doesn't mean that they, don't belong, that they think it doesn't belong in there. There's references that correlate to other Old Testament passages throughout Esther. There's descriptions of the king's court, which is really fascinating because in this book, you'll find references to the king's gate, to the inner court, to the outer court where Haman was, where Esther came in. And we'll be able to see the layout of the palace where they were standing at those times. A French explorer named Dillafoy found those several centuries ago of where that palace stood. It also provides the context and the origin of the Jewish feast of Purim. If we didn't have this book, we wouldn't know the, the Jewish feast of how that came about and why they celebrate it and, and what they celebrate. There's a lot of irony throughout the book of Esther. In fact, irony is a central theme of traditional comedy. Shakespeare used irony a lot in his comedies. You think one thing's going to happen or it seems like everything is rolling toward one way, then all of a sudden it turns on a dime and starts going the other way. It's incredible irony throughout. The exalted in the book become the common. The common become the exalted. The trappers become trapped. The trapped become trappers. God's people are sentenced to death. Spoiler alert. Death ends up coming to the sentencers. All through the book. One thing's going to happen and then it completely turns and goes the other way. So the person of Esther. It's a Persian name meaning star. Some people think that it may have been named after the Persian love god Ishtar. Which speaks to her Persian or secular upbringing. We don't know much about her parents, but she was named by her parents who were living in Persia at that time. She was orphaned, orphaned at a young age and kind of adopted by her cousin Mordecai. He didn't change her name, he kept it the same. But her Hebrew name is Hadassah, meaning Myrtle. We find though that in the book of Esther she's referred to as Esther. 
The author of Esther is unknown. The person probably was well versed in the times, the Persian etiquette, the Persian customs, as well as the Jewish customs at that time. So many people think that it was Mordecai. And if it wasn't, it was maybe a younger contemporary who was familiar with the story and had been passed down or maybe even had, knew, uh, had known Mordecai and Esther. The time of Esther takes place during Ahasuerus' reign, 486 to 464. He was likely in his 30s during this time, maybe into upper 40s. As I mentioned, many Jews did not return to their homeland, so they were just kind of exiled in, uh, in Persia. And what sometimes happens in a land when there's a minority that's, that's in that land with them? What, what are some things that you might think the Jews were dealing with or, or uh, having to, to work around? Persecution. See? Persecution. Discrimination, that's right. Maybe some suspicion. Because as we knew back in, in Exodus, the Pharaoh was a little bit suspicious about the Israelites as they were in Goshen, that they might you know, grow populous and get brave and start to overthrow him. So there's some speculation that the Jews maybe had some suspicion around them. Maybe they were looked at with a different eye. They certainly had different customs. They worshipped a different god. And so they weren't exactly on the same level with the other Persians in that area. At least the last chapter of Esther, chapter 10, was likely written soon after the death of Ahasuerus. There is a commentator I have in my Bible. This is, of course, non-scripturally inspired. But he puts a paragraph in here that I think is very poignant for us to, as we're study, starting this study. He says, Esther, like Christ, puts herself in the place of death for her people. But she receives the approval of the king to live. She also portrays Christ's work as an advocate on our behalf. This book reveals another satanic threat to destroy the Jewish people and thus the messianic line. God continues to preserve his people in spite of opposition and danger, and nothing can prevent the coming of the Messiah. You see, if the king and Haman had had his way in Esther, the Jews would have been annihilated, extinct. And God's promise to Abraham that his line would be the line that the Messiah would come, that his children would be as numerous as the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky would have come to naught. So God raised up a leader in Esther to stand in the place and save God's people. So where is God in Esther? If his name's not mentioned, where is he? I would argue that he's everywhere. His name is not in there. But his hand is on every page in the book. God is everywhere throughout the book. His care, his oversight of his people, the providence that we'll see. It's often unseen unless you know to look for it. Dan Winkler says, God transcends nature, but also bends it to his will. That's why we pray to God with supplication, trying to, to see if he would allow us to have what we're asking for. He gives special care and attention to his people. And there's two key verses that we'll focus on today that we'll see, of course, in the later chapters. Esther 4.14 and Esther 6.13. Esther 4.14, the background is that the Jews have been pretty much sentenced to death. And Mordecai pleads with Esther to go before the king to try to save her people. And Esther's hesitant about going before the king because she's not been summoned. And anybody who goes before the king, even the queen, without being summoned, could potentially be put to death. But Mordecai says to Esther, who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Some versions say, perhaps this is the moment for which you have been created. And so that's something for us to think about. Is this a time that God created us, put us in this time and place for such a time as this, to help somebody or a group of people to, be, uh, to get closer to him or to, to be saved. The other verse is Esther 6.13. Mordecai has kind of gotten under Haman's skin, and Haman wants to get rid of Mordecai. He does not like him. But uh, Haman's wise men and, and his wife Zeresh say to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. You see, there was something special about the Jews, about the Jewish people, that even the Persians knew about. And his wife says, if he's of the Jewish people, you're not going to stand a chance. You will fall before him. The Jews were taken care of. So God is in control of his creation in love 
in correction and sustenance. Could I get three volunteers to read for me? Somebody raise your hand to read. Keaton, would you read Job 37, 1 through 14? Get two others. All right, Chris, would you read Job 38, 39, just the one verse there? And then Barry, Psalm 104, 21. We'll start with Job 37, 1 through 14. This is Elihu speaking to Job about God's care, God's providence. At this also my heart trembles and leaps out of his place. Keep listening to the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. Under the whole heaven he lets it go and is, li and is lightning to the corners of the earth. After it his voice roars, he thunders with his majestic voice, and he does not restrain the lightnings when his voice is heard. God thunders wondrously with his voice. He does great things, and we cannot comprehend. For to the snow, he says, fall on the earth, likewise to the downpour, his mighty downpour. He seals up the hand of every man, that all men whom he made may know it. Then the beasts go into their lair and remain in their dens. From its chamber comes the whirlwind and cold from the scattering winds. By the breath of God, ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen fast. He loads the thick clouds with moisture, and clouds scatter as lightning. They turn around and around by his guidance to accomplish all that he commands them on the face of the habitable world. Whether for correction or for his land or for love, he causes it to happen. Hear this, O Job, stop and consider the wondrous works of God. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. All right, Job 38, 39. Can you hunt the prey or the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lion? So God here is questioning Job saying, do you feed the lions? Do you uh, fill their appetites? And then the answer is in Psalm 104, 21. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their food from God. So God provides the sustenance for the lions. God provides the sustenance and the care for everything. Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God takes care of us. Luke 6, 25 to 33, the Lord takes care of even the lilies of the field, the sparrows. And if he takes care of them and gives them what they need, then how much more will he take care of us in all the times? If you remember in Genesis, Joseph was, of course, taken by his brothers, thrown into a pit and sold to slavery. And then through multiple other times when he was pretty much uh, taken uh, into jail and, and uh, bad things happened to him. He always kept his faith. And because of that, he came second in command to Pharaoh in Egypt. And his brothers had to come before him asking to save them because they needed food during the famine. And when they found out that it really was Joseph, they were afraid because they thought he's going to take revenge. But Joseph said, even though you meant the bad things that happened to me for evil, God meant it for good. See, God rose up Joseph to allow the saving of his people at that time. So God will always find a way to care for his people. Keaton mentioned this last week in his lesson. Divine providence is the governance of God by which he, with wisdom and love, cares for and directs all things in the universe. The doctrine of divine providence asserts that God is in complete control of all things. He is sovereign over the universe as a whole, the physical world, the affairs of nature, nations, human destiny, human successes and failures, and the protection of his people. And that is found all through the book of Esther. This doctrine stands in direct opposition to the idea that the universe is governed by chance or fate. We don't have a God that is sitting back not doing anything. We have a God who is active in our lives and listens to our prayers. So what can we learn from Esther? Number one, when God works behind the scenes, he is still working. Even though we can't see his name, he's still working. Does God's name have to be publicly stated for us to give him credit? Does God's name have to be carved into a tree for us to know that he made that tree and he provides it rain and gives it nutrients from the soil? Does God's name have to be written in the stars for us to know that he created them and that he put the planets in motion? in order to create our days and nights and tides? No. God's name does not have to be written in a book for us to know that he takes care of his people. While God's name is not mentioned, it is not a godless book. 
He keeps his promises. All right, if you have your study guide, let's make sure you have the correct answers here. I'll try to have one of these for each lesson. So if you can, try to hold on to this, and you'll have a collection of six by the end of this series. So the book of Esther is found after which Old Testament book? Start out with a softball. <laughs> Nehemiah. Very good. The timeline, though, of the book of Esther best fits between chapters 6 and 7 of which Old Testament book? Ezra. Very good. Ezra 6 and 7. Who was the Persian king at the time of Esther? Very good. Xerxes is the Persian name, and the Hebrew name was Ahasuerus. Esther is the only book of the Bible in which the name of who is not mentioned. We better get this one. God. Very good. Esther provides the origin of the Jewish feast of Purim. Where is God in Esther? Everywhere. And God's blank is seen throughout the book in the way he cares for and protects his people. Providence. Excellent. All right, so for just the remaining time we have together, I want us to think about God's providence in our own lives. And think about something in your life where you thought you were headed in one direction. And you thought this was the best way for me. And then it didn't turn out that way. And you're looking back on it now, and you're thinking, you know, I am so glad it didn't turn out the way that I thought that my life should go. And it was God that was taking care of me at that time. And I'll, I'll go ahead and start with a, a small story. When I was a junior, senior in high school, I was looking at, of course, colleges and universities to apply to, and my parents were encouraging me to go to a Christian university, and I wanted to go to a Christian university. So I had basically two that I was looking at, Fried Hardeman and Harding, and I applied for their scholarships, for their, uh, for their full tuition scholarship, got the applications in the mail, and filled them both out completely. Went ahead and I filled out Fried Hardman's first and, and mailed it in. And then I filled out Harding's. And at the bottom of Harding's scholarship, it also said, and please include an essay about something or the other in order to complete this application. Well, I was extremely busy at that time. And I was playing baseball. I was on the debate team. Uh, I was in the school play. Lots of other things were taking, taking my time away. I could not write that essay right then. So it sat on my floor in my room for a few days. And then I got a letter in the mail from Fried Hardeman saying, congratulations, you've got the scholarship that you applied for. And so I took that, and that essay for Harding never got written. And I just decided I was going to go to Fried Hardeman. Turns out that that was a very, very providential thing in my life because when I got there, second year, of course, Lacey and I started uh, dating in March of 2003, and we've been together ever since, 20 years. And I could not imagine a more supportive person throughout my training, a cheerleader for, for my, uh, my time going through medical school and, and internship, residency, and then fellowship, eight moves in 13 years. Could not imagine a more supportive person than Lacey. And so I, I believe it was God's providence that took me to Fried Hardeman at that time because he knew that I needed her for, for my, my life. Anybody else think of a way that God's providence was uh, important in their life or came about? Yes. Uh, when I was married three years and had just bought a brand new home and a beautiful wife, I wasn't happy with my home. I knew I was involved in that house and I was a drinker. And uh, so I prayed the prayer one noontime and I was looking at all of this reflection. And I said, God help me, I can't help myself. And within seven weeks, Church of Christ preacher came selling me life insurance. And we decided, we bought that, we decided to talk to us about eternal life insurance. And I considered that whole thing the answer to prayer, but the providence of God, using that preacher who just passed away about a year and a half ago, who influenced my whole life. So one man selling insurance taught you the gospel and changed your entire life. And it was providence that that occurrence happened. Anybody else have something in their life that they attribute to God's providence? All right. Can you expound on that? I was trained as a combat medic, but I got into administration. <clears throat>
God protected you. And then you've been a wonderful encourager of a lot of us here. So it was God's providence that you, uh, that you were able to survive that area, that time. Yes? I think most of us look at our lives and, and we look back and think, you know what? It might have been 1% of me doing something, but 99% came from God. It's all providence. We went kicking and screaming to Washington, D.C. for the Museum of the Bible. It came out of nowhere. Finally, Beth said, wait a minute. They've been recruiting you for four months. I think God really wants you to go up there. <laughs> yeah. So he moved to Washington, D.C. to take care of the Museum of the Bible. Actually, my family just visited the Museum of the Bible a couple of months ago. It's a, it's a wonderful place if you have a chance to go uh, to, to learn about the history of the Bible. That's really neat. Anybody else? Yes. It's a wonderful testimony to just, again, one person helping you to, to find the truth. Yes? The town of, we were living in when I was uh, young, or, uh, <clears throat> and we moved to another town, and my mother heard an announcement on the radio that if you would like your children to attend Bible school to call, and they would have some well, my mother had always been very interested that she wanted her children to go to heaven. So she called that number, and two men came to pick us up, which in this day and age would never do. But they became dear family friends. So the four of us went to... Long story. Anyway, I'll keep it short. Uh, after Bible school, we kept going. And somebody else came to pick us up, and it was this man. And when we were first met, I was 13, and he was 19. So he must have been interested in me. I mean, I don't think he was. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we were, it ended up that my, eventually my mom and dad were baptized. <coughs> two of us were baptized. My mother's mother and two of my mother's sisters were all baptized. Wow. And I just looked back. That has to be God working in my life. I've seen it many times through the years. So Shirley's mother heard an advertisement, and because of that, through multiple other things, she and many of her family members were baptized, and she married a Christian man and is at church with us this morning. Yes? You know, it's good, good for us to talk about this a little bit. We don't do this very often, so I appreciate that. Um, you know, it's a little bit personal, mm -hmm. but um, I think we reflect everybody can can look back where God's blessed us, answered our prayers, or he's just been there for us in his providential way. But Sandy uh, was diagnosed with brain cancer, well, not necessarily brain cancer, 
She took an MRI and we got the results the Monday before Thanksgiving in 2013. And it had a, and you're a radiologist so you can appreciate this, grapefruit sized tumor. And so, and I, and I asked the radiologist, because this, um, you know, what does this mean? He said, well, I don't know for sure. You need to go see an expert, but I would get surgery right away because this is probably glioblastoma multiforme, worst kind of cancer. So we're like, okay, not great news. I, I did some research and I found that the best hospital and, and um, brain surgeon was in the Mayo Clinic and we called them up. I called them up and there's, it's in Rochester, um, Minnesota, it's a long ways away. I called them up, there wasn't a, um, an appointment for two months. But I said, well, can we get on the wait list? And they called me up Wednesday before Thanksgiving. They, they said, hey, somebody canceled. Can you be there on Friday? We flew up on Thanksgiving, saw the doctor, and it was cancer. Um, they got us in to do surgery um, about a week later. Um, so I felt that was providential. And then in the coming, Samantha was only five months old. And so there's a lot of weeks of rehab. And so brothers and sisters of Christ from all the different congregations we've been to throughout the Navy and different places came and helped out when we were living in Phoenix, watched our, our older kids. And, you know, she, she got through it. And then, you guys all know, because we were here in 2018, she had a reoccurrence, and it was worse. She had uh, another surgery, and then uh, nine months of chemotherapy and radiation. It was really bad, but um, we got through it. Um, God answer our prayers, and much many of the congregation here, and you know, prayed for us. It's a loving congregation, and you know, they said you'll never have kids again. Well, we just we listen to doctors because <laughs> doctors <laughs> want to have a lot of confidence, and, yes. and you know, rightfully so. They put a lot of effort into their education. The doctors aren't always right, and God had plans for us to have twins. <laughs> very good and so I, I'm just very thankful for God's blessings I'm thankful for this congregation and all the prayers it's been a while and you know as of July it's been five years wow very good God's taking care of you one more Joe make it a little more personal to this congregation when I got transferred to Charlotte Marty says I'm not going we had a custom built home on a 40 acre farm and a lot of the good things that the God had given us, you know. I couldn't find a job in Columbia, South Carolina, though, so I had to come. And I did. Obviously, Marty came. I mean, 37, 38 years later, she's still here. <laughs> but that put me at Charlotte Avenue, and uh, fortunately, I'd met David Barr far before. Come time to be a point and elder, I'd said no. David stepped in and pushed me, and I, but look what's here now. They then asked me to lead the project to start this congregation, and I mean, I would have never thought that down in Columbia, South Carolina, plus my career went straight up from that point on, so it took care of both ways. So what we've learned is that God uses people here on earth to raise others, to save others, and... Uh, so that, that's what we're going to be talking about through the book of Esther. For next week, please read Esther chapter 1 and 2 before class. Those are going to be our texts for, for next week. And bring your Bibles because we'll be doing a deep dive into the scriptures. And uh, use the remaining time here to talk with visitors. Thank you. <laughs>